We have Randy Sweeney from the Community Foundation sitting back there hiding by Jim Buck. <laughs> and uh, I think now I'll have uh, Greg, would you mind coming up now and just give us a little update on your business career? Sure. This is impressive. I had no idea you have such an active group and such a large crowd. This is a little tribute to the fact of nostalgia, history, and the idea of keeping uh, uh, something alive, which is worthwhile keeping alive, which is exactly the spirit within which uh, the Robert Jackson Center uh, was created. I'll give you a little bit about it. This is uh, currently a work in progress. Randy Sweeney, Kristen Stein are all part of the process. Harold's on the board, uh, so it's kind of like old home week. And in many senses, they're going to hear five minutes worth of what they've heard several times before. It's a time which is absolutely ripe for the study of Robert Jackson. I can't even begin to tell you the excitement that the project has created, not only in Jamestown, not only in Chautauqua County, but in Washington, D.C., and in places throughout the country. I've received a variety of phone calls some of them out of the blue, just simply because they've heard about this project. The project, which I might add, really sort of took initial shape in December of this year. It started at a concept, a concept which, well, normally you have a concept, some, somebody has a brain, you know, brain wave short out, and they, they think about it, and then they go to a feasibility study, hire somebody to do a feasibility study, then they go out and they find a site, and then they hope to figure out somebody who will fund this whole concept. This broke all the rules. We had a concept, uh, a one-page vision statement. Greg Peterson put together a little bit of a video uh, on Robert Jackson. Harold was one of the stars of that. Showed it to a couple of, uh, in fact, three potential benefactors. All of a sudden, they thought, hey, great idea. Let's pursue it. Next thing you know, we're, all, we're walking through the Jamestown consistory happened to be for sale. Uh, we made a pitch to the members. The members two Mondays ago voted on the sale of it to us. Uh, it will close April 1st. We'll literally have our first event May 1st. Uh, that event uh, is sort of going to be a unique one. Uh, Law Day, which is May 1st, and we're going to celebrate that by the main speaker being Eugene Gerhardt. Eugene Gerhardt wrote what I believe to be the only biography at this point on Robert Jackson. It was copyrighted in 1958. You probably have it here in the, the library. Gene is 89 years old. Spent time interviewing Jackson 1947 through 1954 and put together the book shortly after uh, Jackson's untimely death. Well, he's coming to town and he's going to spend a day or two to talk about his experiences with Jackson. Since that time, Dan Bratton, who uh, was Chautauqua Institute president for 16 years and was kind of hoping to gracefully go into retirement, uh, heard this whole concept, listened to my spiel, and now he's going to be the executive director of the Jackson Center. Because of his involvement, he's already been to Washington, and though I'm not at liberty because the camera is on to tell you all the things that are going on, uh, I can just tell you you'll be real excited in the next few months and certainly years as to how that is all going to interplay uh, in the James Center area. And of course, Bruceburg, which is the uh, home of where Jackson spent his early years, is all part and parcel of that process. We've had the privilege of uh, getting benefactors who donated monies for the cause. So this is a real project. It's not a pipe dream. We will be up and going uh, through the good graces of the Community Foundation, the Fenton Historical Society, Jamestown Community College, uh, Chautauqua Institution, collaborations all over the place uh, are all stepping forward to become part, try to become participants. I can tell you that there's a few assistant prosecutors at Nuremberg, all in their 80s, all have uh, contacted me, and we're hoping that sometime soon we'll be able to bring them back so they can talk about the Nuremberg experience, and in addition, uh, talk about the boss, Robert Jackson. It's all very exciting stuff. Uh, just going to kind of ratchet up a little bit the history of this area and a lot of attention we played on Fruitsburg, New York. Let me give a sales pitch. The 
sales pitch is if any of you have any anecdotal stories about Robert Jackson, it's important for us, as you're doing right now, archiving a lot of that stuff. And I'm a big oral history fan. So drop, hit me in the upside the head here later on tonight. I'd like to get your name and just spend a few moments, not necessarily tonight, uh, but getting those stories because that's exceedingly important in preserving the history of uh, Cruzberg, the history of Robert Jackson, and certainly the history of the area. Also, another plug, if you happen to have any old photographs, certainly candid photographs of Jackson, and we could borrow them to make copies, I'd be eternally grateful, and who knows, they may appear up at the Jackson Center, and you'll have a big acknowledgement. Uh, anyways, that's the pitch. That's a little bit about Robert Jackson. Uh, I don't want to take away from the thunder of Harold, because he's the director. Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, your invitation to be here tonight because this community holds a very warm spot in my heart. Firstburg was my birthplace. In fact, I uh, well may be one of the last uh, to have been born here uh, rather than in the Jamestown Hospital. Frisberg is where I grew up, and I am probably one of the last of those who, uh, whose favorite uh, boyhood uh, <laughs> hangout. Excuse me. Excuse sure. Me, I can turn the volume up for you. Go ahead, try. Whose uh, favorite boyhood hangout was Ed Scheinborn's blacksmith shop. Frewsburg is where, as a teenager, I set pins in the bowling alleys owned by Henry Kyle and Ralph Whittle. And uh, where I went to the movies uh, once or twice a week at the old Garfield Theater, uh, now the site of quality markets. It was Frewsburg High School that allowed me to become a graduate in 1945. And uh, Frewsburg was the home of a cute little classmate named Mary Anna Gearhart, who seven years later became my first and only wife. So you see, I'm a Frewsburg product and proud to be so. Now, of course, the reason you came tonight is to hear about another Frewsburg boy, Robert Howitt Jackson. Robert's mother was Angelina Howitt, known to everyone simply as Lina. She was a pleasant woman of great practicality, industry, fortitude, and devotion to her family. Robert's father was William Eldred Jackson, generally known as Will. He was a sociable man, enterprising, ambitious, independent, and he was a Democrat in a region where that breed was rare. <laughs> All Jacksons, it seems, are hereditary Democrats. Will and Lina Jackson's son Robert was born in 1892 on the family farm in Spring Creek, Pennsylvania. That farm no longer exists, but the hill that was part of it is still known locally as Jackson Hill. When Robert was five years old, the family moved to Frewsburg. The family then included a sister, Ella Jackson, who was two years younger than Robert. Ella grew up here, uh, went to school here, later became the wife of Erie Springer, and uh, she worked for many years in the Frewsburg Post Office. Initially, uh, Will and Lina Jackson owned and operated the Frewsburg Hotel uh, on the northwest corner of Main and Pearl Streets. Within a few years, however, the original hotel building went up in flames. Following the fire, uh, Will Jackson purchased a tract of land on East Main Street from Lucy Ann Fenton. Uh, this property included a house which still stands behind the building now known as the Igloo. It also included a large barn which uh, was turned into the W.E. Jackson livery stable. Not long thereafter, he had a new house built on East Main Street and moved the family into it, 
This is the house uh, where a marker now identifies it as Robert Jackson's boyhood home. In addition to the livery business, Will Jackson raised, trained, raced, and traded horses. And it was from helping his father that young Robert acquired his lifelong love of horses. I remember being told by my mother that whenever anyone in Frewsburg bought a new horse, they wanted to test it against one of Will Jackson's trotters. The usual test was a race down Main Street to Pearl Street, down Pearl and over to Faulkner Street, then back up to Main Street. As a young man, Robert Jackson was a good student, an avid reader, a great debater, and sometimes a prankster. I have been told that one Halloween, he and a classmate tied a rope to the school bell tower and pulled the rope across the roof and into a field. Several times during the night, they rang the bell until neighbors came out to investigate. Then finding nothing, they returned home, only to be summoned again by the mysterious ringing of the school bell. Following graduation from high school, Robert uh, took a postgraduate course at Jamestown High School. One of the teachers there, Mary Willard, quickly recognized his exceptional skill with words and introduced him to the works of Shakespeare and other classics. This was a major factor in the development of Robert Jackson's remarkable writing ability. It was at this time that Robert decided he wanted to become a lawyer. His father, insisting that he become a doctor instead, flatly refused to assist him, thus making it necessary for him to borrow funds for law school from his mother's brother, John Howitt. In one year, Robert completed two years of work at Albany Law School. From this, it might be assumed that he spent most of the year with his nose buried in law books but there is solid evidence that he occasionally took time to smell the roses. It was during this year that he met a lovely young lady named Irene Alice Gerhardt. Four years later, she became Mrs. Robert H. Jackson. After law school, still too, too young to be admitted to the bar, Robert clerked and read law in the office of his mother's cousin, Jamestown attorney Frank Mott. Then, having reached the age of 21, Robert Jackson passed the necessary exam and was admitted to the New York State Bar in 1913. Meanwhile, Robert's uh, second sister, Helen Mary Jackson, was born in 1904. Helen was 10 years old when her father died, whereupon her brother became her legal guardian and assumed the role of surrogate father. I'm not uh, going to talk much about Robert Jackson's career as a Jamestown attorney, nor about his service in Washington as Solicitor General, Attorney General, and Supreme Court Justice. All of that is well documented elsewhere. Suffice it to say that his law practice here is legendary. It has been said that of the hundreds of cases he argued, he lost a total of one. As Solicitor General, his performance was such that Justice Louis Brandeis declared that Jackson should be made Solicitor General for life. It also is noteworthy that in addition to his official uh, positions, Jackson was one of a small group of advisors to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In Washington circles, this group became known as the Brain Trust. Throughout his life, Robert Jackson was very close to his family here, especially to his mother, his sister Helen, and later to his favorite and only nephew, Harold Jackson Adams. I remember many holiday celebrations at the Jackson home on Fairmont Avenue in Jamestown. I remember going horseback riding with him, cruising on his boat, the Alibi, going on picnics, driving around the countryside in his Buick convertible, and climbing Jackson Hill with him. In my senior year at Frewsburg High, 
Principal Leland Sanborn asked if I would write and invite Justice Jackson to speak at our commencement in June. On April 16, 1945, I received this note from him. Dear Harold, I have your letter, and if ever I had any reluctance about coming to Frewsburg High School to make a speech, you have melted it. I would like to come and will try to do so, but I cannot give you an ironclad guarantee just now. Subject to the hazards of the time and the demands of my office, I shall accept the invitation. But on the 3rd of May, he wrote again. Dear Harold, you have probably seen the announcement of the president that he has asked me to undertake the trial of war criminals. It is a big job and a good deal of it will have to be done in Europe. The chances are that I will not be here by the 26th of June. I shall have to cancel the promise I made to you because much as I want to obey your orders, I have had orders from just a little higher source. <laughs> when he went to Europe, uh, and particularly to London, to make arrangements arrangements, excuse me, for the war, war crimes trial, he took with him his secretary, who was from Frewsburg, New York. Her name was Ruth Sternberg. Ruth was the daughter of Florence and Ralph Sternberg. Ralph, I believe, was the chauffeur for Miss Lydia Myers. And uh, the Sternberg home was on Falconer Street, adjacent to the Myers residence. In 1946, when the war crimes trial at Nuremberg was coming to a conclusion, I was in the Army uh, stationed near Munich. On the day before the verdicts and sentences were pronounced, Chief Prosecutor uh, Robert Jackson sent his personal bodyguard with orders for me to report to him in Nuremberg so that I would be there for that dramatic and historic occasion. After being uh, discharged from the Army, I became a journalism student at Ryder College in Trenton, New Jersey. From that institution, I received a BS degree, a degree which everyone felt was especially appropriate. <laughs> Uh, during my years at Ryder, I was often invited to spend a weekend with my aunt and uncle. One of my fondest memories of that is that of the justice uh, taking me to lunch at the National Press Club. I remember meeting some of the most uh, prominent newsmen of the day, and I remember having oysters in the half shell for the first time in my life. At that time, Justice and Mrs. Jackson lived in McLean, Virginia, in a wonderful old place called Hickory Hill. For a time uh, during the Civil War, Hickory Hill served as headquarters for General McClellan. This house was surrounded by about six acres of lawn, and there was a small barn and paddock for the Justice's horse. Years later, after the Justice had died, Mrs. Jackson sold the place to a young senator and his wife, John and Jacqueline Kennedy. After living there for a short time, they in turn sold the place to Robert and Ethel Kennedy. On the afternoon of June 27, 1952, uh, Mary Anna Gerhardt was about to become Mrs. Harold Adams. The annual Fireman's Carnival was in full swing, and traffic in Frewsburg was quite a mess. Attempting to steer drivers in the right uh, direction, a Town of Carroll police officer was at the Main and Water Street intersection. When Justice and Mrs. Jackson reached that intersection, the officer asked, are you going to the carnival or the wedding? <laughs> well, replied the Justice, maybe both but I guess we'd better go to the wedding first. Obviously, a sense of humor and ready wit were two of Robert Jackson's most appealing qualities. It has been said of him that his charm of personality, 
his engaging humor, his conversational and anecdotal gifts, and his frank and forthright manner of expression endeared him to all. On October 9, 1954, Justice Jackson died in Washington, D.C. His funeral at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Jamestown was attended by all eight of his fellow justices. That Robert Howard Jackson chose to be buried here in Maple Grove Cemetery is clear evidence that he always considers his roots to be in Frewsburg, New York. If uh, anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yes, sir, Gray. Do you realize the importance or the historical nature of that last day at Nuremberg? No, I did not. Uh, it was exciting. It was dramatic. It was big news at the time. But I did not, and I think many people did not realize the tremendous impact that that trial had on international law and indeed civilization. So, uh, yes. When you're looking out there and you see Hermann Goering and Rudolf Hess, what's your reaction to them? Well, uh, you know, that's the, those are the hey, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, they were celebrities of the day. And uh, yeah. it was uh, interesting, of course, uh, Goering uh, knew darn well that he was going to cheat the hangman. and. Uh, so, uh, and I think, uh, I think my uncle was uh, some quite, somewhat inclined to think that the trial was not as successful as he would like to have seen it because there were a couple of acquittals. But uh, historically, I think maybe that's not a bad thing because it clearly shows that it was not a kangaroo court, that uh, justice was done. I was certainly glad to be there. Is there anything else that I could uh, possibly <laughs> enlighten you about? If not, I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. And yes. Sir. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I, I really don't know much about the Adams family back beyond my grandfather and, and grandmother who lived on uh, Water Street. And uh, Frank Adams and uh, and uh, my grandmother was Flora. And uh, I I really don't know how the family uh, got here. Uh, I there is a story I, I have heard that uh, I can't. Uh, fully vouch for its accuracy, that uh, one of the Adams boys out in Massachusetts uh, was involved in a barroom brawl and uh, left uh, town thinking that he had killed the guy. Yeah, was that Leonard? Right, 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 right. Way back there, right? And, yeah, and he and, got here and realized that uh, the guy well, he came and spent the winter, I understand, and uh, in the spring returned uh, to Massachusetts and found that he had indeed not committed a murder. But he liked the area so much uh, that uh, he uh, built a cabin here. Uh, His older brother was already here, too. Was he? His older brother, mm -hmm. Jason, uh -huh. who uh, the Adams uh, was descended from. Cyrus. Cyrus Adams uh, was descended from his brother. So three I, boys ended up coming. Uh-huh. I had no, I had no very, very little about the Adams genealogy. I'll give you the Great. <laughs> I'd like to have it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. <laughs>
parts of it that relate to this suit. It came from Nancy Roosevelt Jackson, who was the executrix of the estate of William Eldred Jackson, who I believe was Justice Jackson's son. Um, actually, the donation was three suits and three hats, of which this is probably the most interesting suit. And, I, and there was a, one hat was a collapsible top hat, one hat is a straw boater, and then this one, which probably goes a lot better than either of the other two. Um, is Mrs. Jackson's understanding that these items originally belonged to and, ha and had been worn by her father-in-law, Robert Jackson, and that they came, came into her husband's possession following his father's death in October 1954? This particular suit was tailored in Nuremberg, Germany on June 5th, 1946. It appears to be a custom suit that Justice Robert Jackson had made near the end of his service as United States Chief of Counsel at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. There are labels in each piece, and I opened the one on the vest. Um, in, in German, it's a label. It says C.W. Fisher, Nuremberg, Hair, and I don't pronounce it. How what is it? Over Richter. Jackson, which um, goes on to say means literally judge in charge Jackson. 5646, um, the 5th of June, 1946. So then the trial concluded in July of 46, so this was one that he had made just shortly before the end of the trial. He suspects that Robert Jackson wore it in court during the final phase of the trial, perhaps even when he delivered his summation to the judges. Although Bill Jackson did not work with his father at Nuremberg, this suit was Robert Jackson did work with his father. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I've determined that the suit is tailored to fit a person of approximately Robert Jackson's height, five foot eleven inches and not someone several inches taller as Bill Jackson was. Bill Jackson also was an ensign in the U.S. Navy at Nuremberg, and in the Nuremberg courtroom photographs that I have seen, he wore a military uniform, not a civilian suit. So that's what I know about that. I've laid it out so you can just take a look at it. Please don't touch it because it's, if you really, really, really need to, I have some gloves you could use, um, but the oils on our hands get on the textiles and, and eventually will deteriorate them but I hope I've laid them out so you can all see them. And that was indeed the original box that the hat came in. Okay. And these are, are belong to Fenton Dixie Center along with the other pieces that came with the donation. Thank you, Sherry. Um, Let me just point out that this gift to the Fenton came from uh, the estate of William Jackson. And there were two children, right? Harold, Mary, and Bill Jackson. Right. And this the widow who donated this uh, is the granddaughter of Theodore Roosevelt. So there is an interesting tie-in, and as you know, Jackson was very close to Franklin Roosevelt. There's more than uh, meets the eye on this whole country. And our hope is that Nancy will join us sometime soon here in Jamestown to talk about her father-in-law. Uh, I was raised Robert Jackson name came to our house when I was born, and uh, I guess they did that years ago, visited people that had babies, and uh, so Robert asked my mother what my name was, and he said, or she said, <coughs> well, we thought it was going to be a boy, so her name is Howard, <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, his wife was with him also, and said, why don't you name her Irene after my wife? And that's how come I got my name, Irene Boswell. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I have a picture. You have a picture, huh? Of Robert Jackson. <laughs> oh. Can I set that on the table? playing charades 
Anybody wants to take a look at that? It looks like he's doing a Zorro thing or something. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything? There's a story that Betsy's dad used to tell, and I, I suppose it This time, uh, get a motion to adjourn, and then everybody could take a look here and talk to Greg or Harold, and look things over. We can. Well, I'm not done talking. Yet. <laughs> Somebody like to talk to Randy or Kristen while they're here. Appreciate them coming, and uh, appreciate Greg coming, and he's going to give us a copy of this tape for future reference. And I want to thank Phoebe for bringing this uh, display. I want to thank Harold for being here tonight and making You're it. You're very program. welcome. And thank Barb for setting it up. Ready. Okay, now Greg. We have a motion to adjourn. Josh second it. All in favor? Uh, and now we have coffee and some of Jen's crumpets back there. And, and Jen, we're not going to put you on a committee yet. <laughs> <laughs>